The Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota. I'm Mark Kennedy, Chairman of the Economic Club of Minnesota, and with hockey in mind, uh, we are very honored today to have Lou Nanny introduce the Governor General. They're friends from way back. Anybody from Minnesota really doesn't need an introduction to Lou Nanny. He is a hockey legend. He was with the Minnesota Gophers hockey team from 1959 to 1963. He was MVP for the league and scoring champion in 1963. He played on the U.S. Olympic hockey team in 1968. In fact, he was the captain of that team. He came here to the Minnesota North Stars and was with them for a total of 24 years as player, as coach, as general manager. Uh, there are few bigger luminaries in the very crowded group of Minnesotans that we have in the Hockey uh, Hall of Fame, but Lou Nanny is certainly one of the best. So please welcome Lou Nanny. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege for me today to introduce His Excellency, the Right Honorable David Johnson, Governor General of Canada. David was born in Sudbury, Ontario and moved to the Sault Ste. Marie as a young boy. He and I were classmates in school, teammates in hockey, baseball, fast pitch softball. During that time, if you knew David, you wouldn't be surprised about the things that he was destined to achieve. He was an individual that constantly drove himself to be successful in whatever he undertook. His leadership qualities were very apparent in the classroom and in athletics. When we grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, a city in Northern Ontario that had a population of only 40,000, and most of the students at Sioux Collegiate went to college in Canada. As a matter of fact, I don't know if any of us ever heard of Harvard, but David did. David, of course, ended up there. And somehow, he made his career from there. None of us who knew David would be surprised to see his success at Harvard in the classroom and in hockey, and later his appointment as the first non-American to chair Harvard's Board of Overseers. None of us are surprised that he ended up authoring and co-authoring 24 books, and he holds honorary doctorates from over 20 universities. None of us were surprised when he was chosen to moderate the debate between the two candidates for Prime Minister of Canada. However, I will tell you when I was surprised. In 1987, I was general manager of Team USA in the Canada Cup, and we were playing a game in Montreal. After practice, I came back from the rink and I had a phone call from David. So I called the number and it was Principal Johnson's office. I said, who? And the woman said, Principal Johnson, who may I say is calling? I said, you tell him the guy that spent more time in the principal's office than he ever did, Lou Nanny, <laughs> and I should be principal. Where he got a woman in Quebec with a British accent, by the way, I don't know. Four years later, when I went into this business, I was in Montreal doing business, and I went, thought I'd go up and see David. I walk into the office, and the woman says, may I help you, please? And I said, yes, Lou Nanny to see Principal Johnson. She says, oh, you're the guy that spent more time in the principal's office than here. <laughs> well, <laughs> David has gone on to achieve a lot. And so none of us were surprised when he also became president of the University of Waterloo. Now, he's principal of McGill, which is president, and president of Waterloo. But when you think of David, you also want to think about pastimes. Does he have any? And I have to tell you this. David enjoyed fishing, and like every passionate fisherman, he only caught the big ones. One day when we were growing up, he was fishing down at the rapids right by the power plant. We used to catch trout there, speckled trout and salmon. And he came back and he told me he caught a big one a big trout. I said, how big? He said, this big. 
I said, there's no way a speckled throat's that big. Oh, yeah, I did. Well, three weeks later, I was fishing. And you know, around Sault Ste. Marie, a lot of freighters went down. And I was in an area where some of the freighters had gone down. And I was hooked onto something, and I'm pulling, and I'm pulling. And I finally pull it up. And I told David, you're not going to believe what I got. I got a lantern over 100 years old. And it was still lit. <laughs> and he said to me, there's no way it was still lit. I said, well, if you cut a foot off that fish, I'll blow out the light in the lantern. <laughs> you know, David married his high school sweetheart, and they were blessed with five daughters. Sharon has just released her own book. As a matter of fact, she's on a book tour now. And finally, those of us who grew up in Sault Ste. Marie were not surprised to see he was selected as the Governor General of Canada. And he just recently had his term extended. And frankly, I was just at a conference with some of the Canadian leaders, and one very prominent Canadian leader said to me that David Johnson is the finest Governor General Canada has ever had. So with that, I would now like to invite His Excellency, the Right Honourable David Johnson, to the stage, the stage to speak. There's something, there's something there. Thank you. God love you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you can see that you've heard from a very good friend. What surprised me, Lou, is the stories you didn't tell. God bless you. <laughs> Lou is, uh, is one of those remarkable people whom I uh, call a very close friend, and I'm so privileged to have his friendship and to admire what he's done over, over many years. Uh, Lou is a, a talented athlete, you know, but I have never seen a person who has so combined tenacity and intelligence applied to the game as Lou has. It's a marvel to see how he takes the natural ability he has and then those abilities or those powers that you develop from yourself, the tenacity and intelligence, and does things very well. Uh, all of my uh, introductions to Lou has not been as pleasant as the one you just heard. Um, we were opponents and teammates and classmates and um, then we were opponents again when I was playing at Harvard and Lou was playing at the University of Minnesota. The first game we played against them, I think only a minute had gone in the game, and Lou, with a smile on his face, drilled me into the boards. I made the mistake of uh, going into the boards with my face there and my back this way, and as I was picking myself up and trying to shake the stars out of my head, he says, uh, welcome, and there's more to come. <laughs> and there was. <clears throat> Lou and I had the great privilege of uh, playing with some wonderful players and some wonderful volunteer leaders in our community. A team called the Ogomo Contractors uh, was a 17 and under team. Uh, and uh, our teammates, among others, were Phil and Tony Esposito. <clears throat> and Tony was the backup goaltender. And people say to me, come on, Tony Esposito, the backup goaltender, tell me another one. I think Tony was 14 on a 17 and under team. And, and they were great stars as, uh, as Lou was. And I've kept in touch with uh, Tony and Phil, as I have with Lou. And there's a story about Phil at an a, uh, Athletic Hall of Fame um, event in Sault Ste. Marie, our hometown. And uh, it's a bit like Lou's fish story, I think. And uh, Phil was trying to explain that when he grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, conditions were a little different than they were today. And he said, uh, it was Halloween. and. Um, we lived in a section of town where uh, there were more outhouses, outdoor plumbing, than there was indoor plumbing. Not true, of course. They lived in a very affluent section of town, but that's by the by. And so on Halloween Eve, they went out tipping over outhouses. And they found themselves, for some strange reason, back at their own house. And they began tipping over the outhouse. And as they were doing so, they heard great cries from within. Gave it a last push, over it went, they took off. <clears throat> they waited a while and came back in about midnight. And there was Mr. Esposito waiting for them at the door. He says, um, Philip, Anthony, what have you been doing tonight? Oh, we've just been out playing street hockey with our friends, Dad. Hmm. Been roaming around at all? No, no, just street hockey. He said, you wouldn't have been tipping over outhouses, would you? Oh, no, 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 wouldn't do that, Dad. He said, well, I've got this new hockey stick right here, and I'm prepared to give it to you. But I want you to tell me the truth. Were you out tipping over outhouses tonight? Yes, we were, Father. Did you tip over the one in our backyard? Yes, we did, Father. 
So he then took the stick and he beat the devil out of both of them and broke it over Phil's head. <laughs> Phil says, but, but, but dad, but dad, before that, he, the father said, I've got to tell you a story about George Washington. George Washington uh, cut the apple tree down in the yard of his home. And the father came home and discovered that and said, George, somebody's cut the water, the apple tree down in our backyard. Um, I want you to tell me the truth. Uh, did you cut down the apple tree? Yes, father, I cannot tell a lie. I cut down the apple tree. So after Phil and Tony had been beaten over the head by their father, they said, but, but, but father, we told the truth. What about George Washington and the apple tree? George Washington's father was not sitting in the apple tree when he cut it down. <laughs> C'est vraiment un plaisir pour moi d'être ici au Minnesota pour parler de la diplomatie de savoir et d'innovation. It's a great pleasure to be here in Minneapolis-St. Paul and to have an opportunity to talk about innovation between Canada, Minnesota, and the entire upper Midwest region. But first of all, let me offer best wishes on behalf of all Canadians who have such deep and enduring ties with this part of the United States. You know, if you look around the world, this world that is somewhat troubled in spots, I'm not sure you can find a relationship as rich and as mutually beneficial to our two nations as that between the Canadian and American people, and especially the states like Minnesota and Ontario and Manitoba that border one another. And there's so much of that as personal connection. My own history is just filled with those kind of stories. My mother grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. She came there because her father was a... Uh, a locks supervisor at the locks that uh, bridged the 26-foot rapids, the rapids of St. Mary's between Lake Superior and Lake Huron. And my father was Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and they married, and so I'm the product of an international marriage. I was in grade nine, I think, and um, there was an odd fellow service club competition to select young people from uh, four or five of the northern states here in Ontario to um, gather in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and we took a Greyhound bus across the country to the United Nations and spent one week there understanding the United Nations again, an initiative that was cross-border that was attempting to equate young people with uh, the United Nations and um, peace and conflict re resolution. I think that was an early example of what I call a diplomacy of knowledge and action. Um, I was recruited uh, in grade 10 by Don Petty of the Minneapolis Star Tribune to uh, attend Harvard. And there's a story behind that. Uh, Bill Bender was the Dean of Admissions at uh, Harvard from 1939 to 1941, went off to the Marines, fought his war, came back in 1945, knocked on the door of the President James Conant and says, I have some things to tell you. Conant moved Harvard from being an aristocracy under William Abbott Lowell to a meritocracy with a great emphasis on talent. And Bender said to President Conant, you know, this university is a great place and the professional schools are fine but you've got a problem in the undergraduate college. I've watched the graduates of the college lead in war and you've given them an enormous handicap. They're all men. The women are all over at Radcliffe College. The men never see them. Uh, they are all uh, very privileged young men from wealthy New England families who've gone to elite New England private schools. And they never had the opportunity to develop their leadership talents with people different than they are. A broad group of people who come in a range of talents and you have to marshal them and help them lead them into battle. What do you want to do? Dean Bender said, I want to open this, this college, this school, to uh, young people of talent, men and women, who don't have the wherewithal in their families to afford Harvard tuition. He said, what are you doing Monday night at your service, sir? Well, I want you to come and meet the 25 most important benefactors of Harvard University and explain to them why they should give large sums of money for scholarship help to young people and deprive, to reduce the chances of their sons and grandsons attending this university to one third. And they did, and then they enlisted Harvard alumni to look for diamonds in the rough, and Don Petty was the one who, I guess, found a very, very rough diamond in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, had there been a second letter, it would have gone to Lou, but Lou would have come to Minnesota because he wanted to go to a good dentist school, dentistry school and did. And, and that was my experience of, uh, having the enormous opportunity of an education, one of the great American institutions of higher education. Um, and then, of course, Lou is a similar story of someone who left Canada, came to the United States, made so many contributions on so many things. And Lou, the Minnesota Wild are gonna go all the way uh, 
except, of course, if a Canadian team is in the Stanley Cup finals, <laughs> and then I'll hedge my bet a little bit. So we build on a relationship of these remarkable people-to-people -people ties, and they exist between Canadians and Minnesotans in particular. It's in tr true, of course, of the entire upper Midwest. In fact, if you look at the Great Lakes Basin and the states and provinces that are drained by that largest freshwater system in the world, the gross product, gross domestic product, domestic in quotes, of that region is larger than the domestic products of China, Japan, and the United Kingdom put together. Um, a very interesting way of just sizing where we are. Let me highlight a few specifics of our relationship just to sort of underline what we have to build on. And without a doubt, Minnesota is a vitally important state for Canada. We have a shared border, shared waterways, similar climate environment. Isn't it interesting that in northern Minnesota, close to the Canadian border, there is a place where if you look south, the rivers flow into the Gulf. If you look uh, north, um, the rivers flow up into the Arctic Ocean. And if you look east, the rivers flow into the Great Lakes and out into the Atlantic Ocean. We have close energy ties, educational ties that are quite enormous, agricultural ties, trade ties. Our histories and cultures are closely linked to the extent that many Canadians think of Minnesota as the 11th province. And dare I say that many Minnesotans think of Canada as simply a natural extension of the state. Perhaps that's something to do with all the Lake Winnipeg walleye that you eat here, or the fact that you make your Cheerios with Canadian oats. But let me talk about trade between Canada and Minnesota. It exceeds a remarkable $19 billion annually, which means that Canada exports more to Minnesota than we do to the UK, Japan, or Mexico. This is impressive, given Canada's status as a trading nation. And Canada is by far Minnesota's largest export customer. We buy more Minnesota products than your next three largest foreign markets combined. And in fact, 35 US states have Canada as their largest customer. Economic independence, I could go on at length. Canadian Pacific, based in Calgary, Alberta, employs 1,300 people in this state with its US headquarters here. The Mosaic Company, headquartered in Plymouth, owns one of the largest potash mines in Saskatchewan, and that's something. RBC Wealth Management, represented here, John and John and other colleagues from RBC, has its American headquarters here. And Lou, my great friend, is a leader with RBC and has been for many years. Toronto-based Thomson Reuters employs almost 6,700 Minnesotans in Egan. I could go on. So with all of that encouraging and positive and good news, where do we go from here? I think the answer is very simple. We go further. And let me rephrase, we must go further. And by that I mean we have to look at our relationship and reflect on what's working well and what needs work and move towards an even broader, more vigorous engagement. So if you remember anything that I say today, remember this. I'd like all of you to think of Minnesota and this visit as a threshold moment, or to use another vigorous metaphor, a trampoline opportunity. We should mark the beginning of an even richer and more dynamic phase in the relationship between Canada and Minnesota and the upper Midwest states. It's so important that we succeed in strengthening our ties in this part of the continent. Why is that so? Because it's increasingly clear that regions will be key factors in our well-being and prosperity in the years to come. Indeed, they already are. And why are regions so important? They're important because in spite of our ability to communicate instantaneously around the world, talent and capital still need a place to call home. And they still tend to gather in clusters or innovation ecosystems, as we sometimes call them. And so creating these kinds of innovation clusters can lead to all kinds of good things economically and socially. Without a doubt, the upper Midwest and its Canadian neighbors share geographical and climatic features that make for a regional economic ecosystem in the environmental sense. So why not conceive uh, this as an ecosystem when it comes to learning and innovating and prospering together? I want to return now to something I mentioned earlier, the concept of the Diplomacy of knowledge. I had a taste of that in that first anecdote I mentioned, being on a Greyhound bus traveling from the Twin Cities to New York for the United Nations and back. 
and having the wonderful exchange of knowledge that goes with kids who are 15 or 16 years old. The diplomacy and knowledge is just a way of saying how we stand to gain so much when we form partnerships in learning, in innovation, in business, in culture, in society. It's about our ability and our willingness to work together across disciplines and across borders to share knowledge, expertise, and resources to improve our lives. There are so many examples of how this is occurring. In fact, this morning I participated in a discussion at the University of Manitoba, Minnesota on teaching and research partnerships between Canadian and American schools. As you might guess, water was one of the important themes. Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, the ecosystem which drains into the Great Lakes and our responsibilities for that. And so many examples came back to that where our collaboration permits us to deal with challenges and manage opportunities so much better. I was referring to an example from um, one of the last things I worked on in my last university, the University of Waterloo, where I was president for 12 years, was a, um, a water institute for a short period of time. The acronym for the Water Institute, Waterloo Water Institute, was WeWe, Wee, and we thought that wasn't a very good <laughs> word to describe, and so we changed the name. But we had, of the thousand professors, we had about 125 from disciplines ranging from anthropology to zoology, all connected to water. Our lead industrial partners were GE and IBM, IBM on systems, GE on equipment, sensors, filters, etc., and about another 50 or 75 smaller companies. We began by mapping the Grand River, which flows through southwestern Ontario, and all the municipalities along that river were members, partners, to record their dealing with water in various ways. Another seven or eight universities, now extending those to universities in the Midwest. And um, some very interesting ambitions out of that particular project, two that I remember especially because one reaches back in history and the other reaches geographically across the, the globe. The, the one in history was after the Iran-Iraq war, um, a team from um, our Water Institute were in uh, southern Iran restoring the, uh, the gardens, the Garden of Eden, the gardens of Babylon. It's believed that the Garden of Eden, Eden which is depicted in the Old Testament in the early chapters, in fact, uh, was based in Babylon, which was the first settled city in the world, we think, 7,000, 8,000 BC, where people ceased to be hunter-gatherers and became uh, agrarian peasants and began to grow food, settle in one place, and then produce surpluses. The people who descended from that original settlement, 7, 8,000 BC, were actually Shiites who were more connected with Iran, Shiites, than they were the Sunni leadership of Saddam Hussein. And so during that war, he um, opened up the the dikes, um, the dams, and he flooded the marshlands. These people lived uh, as marsh farmers. Um, and so a population of about a million people was reduced to about 400,000 just by an act of genocide to destroy them as people he saw as the enemies within. So it fell to the Water Institute to be part of the International Consortium to restore the Garden of Eden, uh, Babylon, which was a fascinating challenge, not simply technical, that was the easy part, but cross-culturally. The other interesting thing that um, our Water Institute did is having mapped the Grand River, um, they then took on a, a little bit larger project, which was the Rhine River flowing through a number of European countries to try to do the same mapping and try to add the value so that one could uh, take those waterways and make them better. I just give that as one example that was part of our discussion this morning and I could give 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 and all of you could contribute to them with a the simple message that we we gain so much by collaborating, by putting our best thought together and ensuring that one plus one adds up to two. And what's true of Canada and the upper Midwest in learning is true of Canada and the United States as a whole. About 30,000 Canadians are studying in US schools, about 12,000 US students in Canada. One of the statistics I really love because each of those students will have a lifelong connection to their host country, just as I have with the United States. And I'm, I guess I'm almost obsessive about pushing young people to study beyond their natural frontiers. When Lou and I were at the Sioux Collegiate Institute uh, and it came to completing my application to Harvard, the high school principal had to send a letter of reference. Our principal, Mr. Sparling, who was a very good man, fine teacher, decent man, wouldn't sign my letter. He said, I don't want you going out of the country. Um, 
Fortunately, the football coach, who was also a history teacher, said, I'll sign the wretched letter. And he says, you'll go because you've been far too big a frog and far too small a pawn, and you've got to get your head knocked off by people who are tougher and faster than you are on the football field and in the classroom. And so and he was absolutely right. And um, that was a hurdle to overcome. Lou overcame it as well and came to the University of Minnesota. I see it in my own children. We have five daughters. We're so lucky. They began international exchanges at age 12, and I guess I began them at age 15 when I went on that tour to the United Nations from here. And there are three things that I've watched in my children that have been quite profound in their development from international, from cross-cultural exchanges. One is that curiosity, which is natural to children. Children begin asking why from almost the moment they can talk. And we parents regrettably get tired of it and say, stop asking why, just go and read your book or play in the playpen or whatever. Their natural curiosity for difference becomes accentuated by experience with difference. The second thing that happens is they become more tolerant, but tolerant in the richest sense of that word. Not just tolerant in, I kind of accept difference and it's okay, but being genuinely interested in what makes for that difference. What are the ingredients of that culture? They become appreciative of difference. There's a lovely expression from Saint-Exupéry's Le Petit Prince. He says that, uh, I am different from you, but I do not diminish you. I enrich in you. That's what happened. And the third thing, which is the real bonus, is their judgment becomes better. They become wiser because they have a broader base on which to make judgments. So they're less inclined to jump to conclusions from the first evidence that presented, to think of the other side, to think of further evidence, to think of how a different culture would approach this issue. And those three things, curiosity, tolerance, and respect, judgment and wisdom are very important ingredients in the development of a human being. And cross-cultural education is so important to that and how fortunate we are in our two countries to have such rich crossing back and forth. It's that in that way. Let me share another number where collaboration of what I'm describing is important, the diplomacy of knowledge. It's publishing. Canadians are very strong partners. We have about one half of 1% of the world's population. We publish about 5% of the articles in science and engineering, <clears throat> so that's a 10 to 1 ratio. The European Union ratio is about 7 to 1, so Canada publishes above its weight in its publication ratio. About half of those articles are internationally co-authored. That is, one or more authors are non-Canadian, and about half of that half are, are US. So Canada, being a small <clears throat> country, is given to international collaboration <clears throat> in joint research. And what an enormous benefit it's been for us to do that. Let me just list four reasons why I think Canadians are good collaborators in learning and innovation. First of all, we believe deeply in the value of working together and learning from one another. We came to this belief early and out of necessity, as in Minnesota and the upper Midwest, our climate and geography can be challenging, to say the least. In fact, I was in alert in northern Canada about six, seven weeks ago, and this is the most northerly settlement in the world. It was a change of command of our military, and the temperature on the thermometer was minus 45 degrees Celsius. I'm not sure what that translates in Fahrenheit, but it's cold. And it was about minus 52 or 53 with the wind chill, and we were outside for a memorial for about 10 minutes, and that was about the limit. And um, we actually went from there, um, flew to Saudi Arabia for the uh, funeral of the king, where it was 45 degrees Celsius plus, quite a challenge in that area. And I was saying about my time in alert um, that those, those three epic relationships that we see down through civilization, man against nature, man against man, and man against himself, are accentuated in those northern geographies. And of course, we've shared the northern geographies and we've had to master them in the right way. We learned to collaborate. The first Europeans were wholly dependent on the willingness of the Aboriginal people to share their knowledge. In fact, Champlain's first settlement in Port Royal in 1608 only survived the first winter because of fresh meat from the Indians. And they taught Champlain and his people how to make a tea from evergreen needles, which we now know had vitamin C to correct scurvy. That's the way they survived, to sharing that knowledge. The second thing is that Canada has tried to make quality education affordable. Because of this, generations of Canadians have had a better chance of overcoming barriers, such as discrimination, poverty, and social immobility. It's been a great triumph of Canada and the United States that public education has been the great lever, the great platform for equality of opportunity. 
Our challenge in John Gardner's great statement is how you have equality of opportunity and excellence too, as mutually reinforcing qualities and not mutually contradictory. I have an OECD chart that I often refer to, and it, looking at social mobility, equality of opportunity, it measures the degree to which a society, a nation, one of the 32 OECD countries, children meet or exceed their parents' level of education. If that happens on a good scale, upward mobility, if it doesn't, bad. Uh, they divide the populations into 20% quintiles. And guess what? In the top four quintiles, top 80%, Canada actually is number one in the degree to which children exceed, meet or exceed their parents' level of education. So you say, all right, and the bottom 20% got to be pretty good, eh? Number one, two, three, we're in the bottom third. Bottom third. What's happened to that dream in Canada that life should be better for our children than it is for us? Well, part of it's our Aboriginal population. It's 4% of the total population, about 7% of the under 25s. And other pockets in large cities where the poverty trap just continues generation after generation. It's an enormous challenge. We have a good base to start from. And we have much to learn from some of the things you're doing in the state, for example, in early childhood education, which I just find breathtaking. And the fact that you're measuring outcomes so well is a lesson to us all. We have much to learn. This, is, after all, is the place of the Minnesota miracle. The third characteristic is our success in combining accessible education and excellence. As I said about John Gardner's statement, it's not a case of either or, but rather both and. You want to expand the talent base of your country to the very extreme, and then use that larger core of talent to improve the human condition. And from that, of course, you get more pinnacles of excellence. Fourth, new Canadians are encouraged to retain and celebrate their culture and language while embracing the values of Canada. And of course, that begin, began with Champlain, our first governor, learned many of the Indian languages, befriended all of the Indian tribes except the Mohawks, uh, the Iroquois, because they were the enemies of all the others, and he couldn't bridge that gap, but he did for a period of time and established peace and learned that language as well. Uh, the great bargain with our French Canadian citizens was in 1860, 1763, after the last British war fought on uh, Canadian soil, where uh, our French Canadians were guaranteed their language, their religion, Roman Catholicism, and their law, the civil law from France. And that bargain, that inclusiveness, that ability to live with difference has been a characteristic of the country ever since. Canada's approach is an inclusive one. It's not perfect, of course. We struggle to reconcile our differences like any other society, but most Canadians are remarkably open and willing to work across borders, cultures, and disciplines, and that includes especially, of course, with our American friends and neighbors. One of the joys of this job is you have a chance to meet really interesting people. And I was saying earlier today, Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, was with us a year or so ago, and she's a research chemist by background, and she's, like me, quite curious. So we had a pact that I'd cross-examine her for 10 minutes and she would cross-examine me. In my cross-examination, it was wither the European Union that had won the Nobel Peace Prize a couple of years before for peace in Europe for 60 years, quite an achievement. Her question to me was, how on earth can Canada, that crazy quilt of multiculturalism, function? How can you create unity out of diversity on your American shield, of course? And I gave her a book called Why Nations Fail by um, James Robinson in Harvard and Darren Osamoglu of MIT. It's a product of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research Global Society Project. And their thesis is very simple, why nations or societies fail. Those societies that are inclusive in their economics and their politics rise, virtuous circle. Those that are extractive, different word than ex exclus excluding, extractive are in a downward spiral. Extractive, and she, her English is quite good, but she stopped for about five minutes and canvassed with her German colleagues uh, the different synonyms for the word extractive, they came up with 17 in Germany. But you get my point. Um, the best illustration of that is uh, Korea, which in 1949 was uh, uh, a unified peninsula. Uh, North Korea was actually much more advanced than South Korea. One went the inclusive route, the other went the extractive route, and look at the, look at the consequence. This afternoon, we'll be participating in a Canada-US agricultural innovation discussion. I look forward to that because Agriculture, agricultural innovation, raising up the value is so important. Uh, our region, Canada and US, just over either side of the border, is amongst the most productive in the world and amongst the most innovative in uh, dealing with food security. 
We are trading and collaborating. In 2013, Minnesota-Canada bilateral trade in agriculture reached about 2.1 billion. Canada is a top market for this state's agricultural and agri-food exports. But we must do more to innovate, to meet the pressures of growing populations and finite land and resources. We have so much to gain from working together on this. This region is a national hub, international hub for agricultural innovation. Just think of the 200 or so food companies, small to very large, in the immediate vicinity of Minneapolis-St. Paul. The work being done in crop genetics, animal science, precision agriculture, biosense, potential for great breakthroughs in food security and safety, energy interdependence and resource preservation. Canada can be a strong partner for this region. Let me also refer to the idea of an innovation corridor connecting the upper Midwest and Canada, the kind of imagination and initiative we need in order to create a truly regional innovation ecosystem. I say imagination because a region is much more than simply a geographical or political entity. A region is a social construct requiring people to think, feel, and act in a shared way. And to be frank, I think that's a bit of a challenge for both Canadians and Americans, not only because we're separated by an international boundary line, but because we still tend to imagine our countries in terms of an east-west orientation rather than also a north-south one. We need to think north-south and need to act on it. And one major reason why we need to act is because we live in a dynamic, rapidly changing world and we need to compete. In fact, it's, it's sobering to think that this generation may be the first generation where our children cannot expect their lives to be better than their parents in terms of prosperity, in terms of healthy communities, etc. First time in Canadian history where that important part of the Canadian dream, immigrate to Canada and life will be better for your children and your grandchildren than it is for you. And of course, an answer to that great dilemma is to innovate and to collaborate very tightly. In um, just one of the many examples that I take from my travels, I think we've been to 45 different missions to different countries in the world in the four years that I've had the pleasure of holding this job. In Southeast Asia, they're building a high-speed rail network running from Hong Kong all the way down to Indonesia with tunnels connecting Malaysia, a 21st century Silk Road. Think of the Silk Road of a thousand years ago and coming back. This extensive rail network will transform the politics, culture, and economy of Asia in a manner similar to the interstate highway system in the mid-20th century in the United States. I don't need to tell you that the competition is fierce. Canadians and Americans likewise need to redouble our efforts to forge new links and partnerships. And I think if we have any enemy, it's the enemy of complacency. Perhaps we've allowed our friendship and those deep ties to say we can kind of rest on the oars a little bit. Well, Lou Nanny wouldn't let us rest on the oars at all. He would have us going all the time. Let me close with um, one of my favorite metaphors of uh, diplomacy of knowledge and action. It's um, Thomas Jefferson, um, who uh, referred to a candle of knowledge. And Jefferson said, when you light your unlit candle from my lit candle, uh, my light is not diminished, it's enhanced. And, you know, let that candle be the, uh, the great uh, talisman for us as we move forward. Uh, one of your colleagues is leaving the children's literal children's theater here in Minneapolis St. Paul to come to head our Shaw Festival in Canada. We embrace that wonderfully. So in his honor, I leave you with two of my favorite lines from Shaw. Some people see things as they are and wonder why. We dream of things that ought to be and ask why not. Why not? Let's do it. Thank you. Merci. <laughs> Sure, yeah, great. I've run over time. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your time with us and sharing your insights. Um, <clears throat> we do have time for a couple questions, and there are microphones circulating around the room. Um, I'll take the liberty of asking the first question. While serving in Congress, I was part of the Canadian American Interparliamentary Exchange. And um, those meetings uh, were largely cordial because uh, the issues in dispute were not what I would call contentious issues. They tended to be more nettlesome issues. So I think that speaks to the closeness of our relationship. Um, but having said that, in your remarks today, you talked repeatedly about the need for better collaboration, especially in research and education. What are some concrete ideas of policies or programs that could advance that goal? 
Jim, you're quite right. Uh, you know, our relationship is such that when we do have issues, as they will arise inevitably between two countries, we bring uh, evidence to bear on them in a sense of finding a common ground. I guess one of the traditional ones that uh, we should celebrate is the International Joint Commission. I think the Boundary Waters Treaty was signed in 1909, and out of that came this bilateral commission, representation from all of the states and provinces that uh, deal with the Great Lakes Basin. And we have, I think, managed that waterway, not perfectly, but probably much better than any bilateral wa waterway in the world. That would be one that is uh, very important. A second would be the Fulbright Scholars Program, where there is a conscious exchange of people across the borders. Sharon and I were in Japan in 1980 or 81, and um, we were guests of the Japan Foundation, so we had an opportunity to meet interesting people from different media. And I remember being at the um, at a dinner that um, one of the Tokyo newspapers in English uh, had prepared, and there were four or five Fulbright scholars there, and our host was saying, you know, of all of the things for good that have happened in the 20th century, I'd put this as number one, the Fulbright scholars. We have a very rich Fulbright scholar exchange between Canada and the United States. Um, I could go on and on with the specific examples, but the ones that work best are ones that just arise because of the natural propensity of people to work together. And if my chemistry lab uh, in uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba has some particular problems, very often they're solved better by joining together with the chemistry lab at the University of Minnesota that you get a couple of angles. And I'll just illustrate that with one story. Um, at university, we had to major in one subject, and then we had to take a couple courses outside of our broad field. So I was in international relations and social science, had to take a couple of humanities courses and a couple of natural sciences courses. One of the natural science courses was taught by George Wald, who won the Nobel Prize uh, for chemistry of vision. And he taught a class of 1,000, could have been 2,000, but that was the largest hall we had. And he was determined that non-science majors would learn something about science. And one day he came in and he said, uh, this was a very fateful day in my life. 50 years ago on this day, I almost took my own life. Well, I'll tell you, that captured our attention. And he said, I was, I guess, very bright in science, into biology and then biochemistry. Uh, advanced, finished my PhD, and I was working on my postdoctoral work, and for six months I could get nowhere. I, I was just hitting a bind. And he said, I, I was in my little garret of an apartment at three o'clock one morning, and I began to become fearful of what I would do to myself, so I got up and I went back to my lab. The lights were out, but there was a fire alarm light at the corridor, and it was just enough for me to see through the keyhole to put my key in, and there was a light inside the lab, and here was my lab equipment over here, and I became very anxious because I saw my blind inability to get any further. But my gaze turned over here to another corner with a different lab from a different subdiscipline, and all of a sudden the light went on. I saw my work from a different angle, and that led to the work that won a Nobel Prize for me. And so that's why I'm trying to teach you something about science, so that you look at things from a different angle. And I think that's what comes with collaboration. So those are not specific examples of the concrete project. There are many but they're examples of the philosophy of mind that brings us together. Thank you. A question over here, I think, and we only have time for one. I'm taking the cue from Kristen at the back of the room. Is there a question over here? Here we go, and then we'll close. Just as you're coming to the microphone, my wife just published uh, her first novel uh, about three weeks ago, and the title of it is uh, Matrons and Madams. Matrons is the... Uh, subject her grandmother, who was the superintendent of a hospital in Lethbridge, Alberta, and Madams is the lady who ran a brothel in the same city. So uh, we had this great uh, baptism of the book, and our seven-year-old grandchild got up to ask her a question and said, Granny, can you ex please explain the title? And she says, well, um, my chauffeur over here, uh, the trailing spouse, um, the governor general, answers all the difficult questions, so he'll answer it. So I got up on my feet and I said, I'll answer the question with respect to the first half of the title, and your grandmother will explain to her seven-year-old grandson the explanation for the second half of the title. <laughs> Hello, my name is Kalina Newmark. I'm a member of the Toledo Dene Band in the Northwest Territories, Canada. Um, my question to you, and I'll kind of have a comment after, but is what do you think are the biggest challenges uh, facing First Nation people in terms of education? 
And so for me, my mother was a part of the residential um, school boarding system. So for many of you who don't know the history, um, at that time, Native people were forcibly taken from their families as children and brought to these uh, religious schools that were funded by the government or assisted by the government. Um, so my mom didn't graduate um, from high school, uh, but luckily for me, I was able to attend and graduate from Dartmouth College in the United States. Um, so I'm wondering, what do you think are the challenges faced by Native people? within the education system in Canada. Thank you. Well, I think our greatest challenge is to duplicate your experience. What a wonderful experience you've had going to Dartmouth. Dartmouth, in the days of Daniel Webster, what's Dartmouth, about 1707, thereabouts? Am I close? Started? Yeah. Um, Daniel Webster in the United States was a famous law case where he was defending Dartmouth College, and he says, uh, it's a little university, but there are those of us who love it. Um, my brother went to Dartmouth. and. Uh, very early on, uh, it embraced uh, Native people, Dartmouth did, and it was a pioneer in that respect. You know, Einstein once said, for every complicated question, there's a simple and wrong answer. And that's the approach we must make to uh, First Nations Aboriginal people's education. We tried a simple answer, which was the residential schools. Didn't work very well, did it? So uh, I think our enemy is really complacency, complacency of, of um, non First Nations people in understanding the history of our country, where First Nations people have been so important, Métis people have been so important, and then trying to craft solutions that are true to the circumstances of the people that want them. It's a phrase from Shakespeare that I love. It's uh, Polonius to his son going from Denmark to Germany in Hamlet. He says, to thine own self be true, and it shall follow as the night the day that then thou canst be false to anyone. We must be true to um, the educational aspirations of our First Nations people. Um, and begin building that way, have that inclusiveness that I spoke to. We have enormous funding gaps. We thought we'd reached a solution a year ago with the Indian Education Act. Didn't work because I don't think we were decentralized enough. Our challenge is to get back at that. But for me, that's Canada's most important domestic issue. And uh, before I die, if I haven't done something to move the needle on that one, I will have lived in vain. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota.